Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. This is the Fading Memories podcast. Thanks for joining us today. We are talking about how to have conversations with your parents about their health and other aging issues. With me is Ashwini Papat, and she has had this experience multiple times and she came on to talk to us about and how to get past some of those barriers that older adults in certain cultures put in the way of helping our loved ones age well. So thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. You know, after over 300 plus episodes, I've had this conversation about finances, which is very taboo in a lot of cultures and gener older generations, but not, I can't recall this specific conversation across the board on aging and health. So why don't you give us a little bit about your background, why you're passionate about this conversation, and then we'll get right into it. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so I'm really excited then that we're actually going to be having this conversation today. So I am, like Jennifer mentioned, I'm Dr. Shwini Bapat. I'm a palliative care doctor and caregiver coach with a Pine EMD, and I'm also a daughter. And my dad was actually recently diagnosed with dementia just three years ago. And so it's been interesting because, you know, as a palliative care doctor, I've had hundreds I would say thousands of discussions with other people's parents about what's important to them now, now that they're living with dementia and making sure that we honor that. And despite everything that I knew as a palliative care doctor, um, talking with my own parents and my own dad was remarkably hard. And I would say like having the talk with my parents, with my own parents was much harder than talking with someone else's parents. Um, and so when I think about what the talk is, uh, I'm really meaning everything that makes you and your parents so uncomfortable that you avoid it. And it's everything from where your parents want to live as they get older, the type of medical care they want and don't want, um, where they want to live the last months of their life, who's going to pay for all of this, and what do they want from me and what do they expect from me as their adult child or as um, if I'm the relative or the caregiver for my parents. Um, and to be honest, this talk is hard and I realized it in, with my own parents. And to be honest, I could only take it so far before my colleague and coach actually had to take over the conversation. I think because it was uncomfortable to share for my parents to share with me, honestly, some of their wishes. Um, and it's emotional and, uh, it's very emotional. And to be honest, when they eventually shared what their wishes were, uh, one of my colleagues who's a coach, she wrote out their wishes. When they eventually shared that with me, as I was reading it, I actually teared up. And I, I was really uh, kind of shocked by some of the things that they were sharing, not because it was unreasonable. I think it was because I wasn't ready to hear it. Mm, that's a very good point. Yeah. We we need to know these things, but I'm a, I'm assuming it's much, well, you've kind of stated it, that it's much harder to have these conversations with family, parents, yeah. maybe even siblings or grandparents than it is obviously with patients. Can we take one quick step back? I have talked a lot about palliative care, but can you, okay. can you kind of explain how, like what you do as a palliative care doctor? Because I've talked about the care, but not like your specific role in the care, just for people who may not have heard that episode yet. Awesome. Um, so palliative care and as a physician, it's all about helping someone live well with whatever illness that they have. And the idea about behind palliative care is to support them emotionally, physically, psychologically, socially, to really provide more holistic support. 
And the real important part is that you can get palliative care at any point, at any age, at any stage, and at, at any prognosis of your illness. So I've taken care of patients with cancer who were expected to be cured of cancer, and they were cured of cancer. But my role in their care was all around helping them um, better manage the pain that was caused by the cancer itself or by the nausea or vomiting caused by the treatments. In the case of dementia, a huge part of what we do is making sure we have early conversations with the person who just got the diagnosis of dementia or who's living with dementia or their family members about what's important to them now, now that they have this diagnosis, how they how do they want to live? How do they want to be cared for? And at later points, at later stages of dementia, we will help manage things like some of the behavioral changes that may come about, some of the personality changes that may come about. Um, but ideally early, and I say ideally because to be honest, it doesn't happen very often. And that's actually a huge part of why we started this caregiver coaching service is really to provide, um, to help support early conversations that involve the person that is living with dementia so that they get a say in what they would want as they move forward. We're working towards it, but we need much better early diagnosis and faster diagnoses so that we can have these conversations early yeah. on. Cause my mom was real good at denial mm -hmm. until she moved into, you know, not knowing what she didn't know. That word's going to slip my mind <laughs> this morning today. <laughs> it is a Monday. And she literally was not formally diagnosed until mid stage, at which yeah. point it was like, duh, <laughs> yeah. know, like yeah. tell me something I didn't know for years. And her right. mom had, vascular dementia also probably mm -hmm. mixed dementia so it's not like we weren't familiar we just did denial really well so what <laughs> i was going to ask the question mostly of your patients how yeah. many of them when you say like how do you want to live well now after this diagnosis how many of how many of them kind of go into denial or you don't get a very constructive answer uh, it depends. If they're coming to me and if they're talking to me, that probably like through the coaching service, that means they want to talk about it or they need a safe space to talk about it because maybe talking with their kids feels a little uncomfortable, like talking to them directly feels uncomfortable, but talking to a third party is easier and they need to get it out and then they can share it with their children. Um, so if they're coming to me in that aspect as a coach, then usually they're a lot more open to having that discussion because they they want a say in that care. If it's the other way where it is the um, adult children coming to me and being like, I need to have this conversation with my parents, but every time I've brought it up, they shut it down. That's a very different conversation. And with that, I think you have to be a lot more delicate and a lot more sensitive. Um, in terms of having the conversation and in terms of how you kind of advise that adult child to approach the conversation. And I will say that um, I do want to address that one point you made, which is that uh, ideally, you know, if someone's diagnosed earlier, they can take part in the conversation themselves. Uh, a lot of the conversations that we have with adult children, it is actually around how do I take care of my mom or dad with dementia because we didn't talk about it and now it's too late. And I want to say that even in that case, uh, when you work with like a skilled coach or a skilled palliative care doctor, they can help you figure out what your parent would have wanted based on the type of life that they lived and the type of choices that they made. So in that case, for all of those people that did not have that conversation, and now it's too late for their parents to take part in that conversation, um, it's still worthwhile because you can still get uh, a clear idea of a clearer, I would say, idea of what your parents would have wanted. You just need maybe like 
to sit down with a skilled person that can bring it out from the stories and from the way in which your mom or dad lived their life. I could see that being a huge blessing is one of, you know, my challenges and one of caregivers challenges is, you know, like my mom always said, I don't want to be a burden to you, but I'm going to live in my home forever. Okay. Well, those are mutually exclusive. And we <laughs> never, this, like my, my long-term listeners know this. My dad had kidney, he had diabetes. He passed away from kidney failure. Today actually would have been his 83rd birthday had he made it this far. And we never discussed what would happen with my mom if he went first, which was a very logical conversation. Um, he just assumed she'd come live with me. And while he was in the hospital, that was, it became very apparent. That was not a good thing. Not for her, not for her dog, not for me. It was across the board, not a great idea, but the making the decision to move her to memory care was still extremely difficult knowing that she did not want that. That was not what she wanted. And as it turned out, she lived in memory care for three years. She had friends. She got into mischief, nothing serious. She never got in trouble, but it was just like, she was as much of herself as Alzheimer's allowed her to be. And I don't think she would have had that. I know she wouldn't have had that living with me. It's just, she wouldn't have had those people who accepted her for her, you know, herself. My yeah. favorite story is when she, she had a repetitive story that she said all the time and she launched into it one day and her, her, her friend basically slapped her knee and said, you've told me that story 803, <laughs> 837 times. And I was like, that's a very specific number. And I was <laughs> laughing because I thought, that's kind of interesting that she remembered, like my mom has told this woman this story so many times she's remembering <laughs> it's going into her long-term memory. And then like five or six weeks later, she actually could repeat the story as my mom was telling. And I was like, Oh my God, this is like elder abuse, <laughs> you know, but it was just, it was fascinating to watch. And there was never any judgment when she said, you've told me that story 837 times or whatever it was. That's 37 is not quite the right number, but the regular listeners probably remember better. <laughs> um, it wasn't, it was more like a statement. I mean, it stopped my mom in her tracks. My mom was like, I couldn't possibly have said that. Many times. <laughs> but it like, if I had said that, my mother would have gotten angry. Right. And I can't imagine the delivery being that different. Yeah. So it was just, you know, it was definitely memory care was the right place for her. And she would never, ever have considered it. So, you know, having somebody like yourself that could maybe bring out the reasons that memory care might have been a good choice before I made that decision, because that was really hard. And it took her about six weeks to acclimate. Those first six weeks were horrifying, <laughs> to say the least. There were days when I was like, I don't know about this, man. I think the executive director belongs here because he thinks she's going to get used to this. And I think he's crazy. He was right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think that's very hard because um, the on the one hand, she said she didn't want to be a burden to you. And I hear that all the time from adult parents. Uh, I don't want to have this conversation with my adult children because I don't want to be a burden to them. I don't want to make them sad. I don't want to make them get emotional. And the truth is this conversation about how you want to be cared for uh, as you get older, it's probably the biggest gift you can give your children. Um, is it emotional? Yes. Is it going to make them tear up? Probably. And yet it's still going to be the biggest gift that you're going to give them. And then on the other hand, I think about uh, how your mom said, uh, and I don't want to be in a nursing home. And so this one is always really tricky because... I don't know anyone that willingly wants to be in a nursing home. I also think um, nursing homes have changed over time and there are definitely better ones. And if you visit them, you get a sense of what kind of activities they have, programming they have, things like that. So I also don't think, uh, you know, there's a range of different types of nursing homes, but I do think a lot of folks associate nursing homes with just this really depressing, decrepit place to be. And some still are, and that's why it's worth visiting and making sure it's a place that uh, you're okay with. 
And I would also say like, for a lot of folks, there isn't a choice. And I think that's the truth of it. There isn't a, a another option that's available to them because if you can't stay at home safely and um, your children can't take care of you safely either, um, there you don't really have a choice in that matter. And the best choice you can make is picking out the best kind of home or uh, place for your parent. And the best choice you can make and the thing that you prioritize the most is how can I keep my parents safe now? Um, and so when we do have these early conversations, a lot of people will say, you know, I don't ever want to end up in a nursing home. Okay, great. Can you tell me what about the nursing home you don't like or you're not looking forward to and what aspects of being home you really enjoy? Because regardless of what situation you end up with, maybe we can uh, kind of optimize the things you really enjoy about being at home. And let's talk about, are there other ways to keep you at home for longer if possible? Can we make plans for that? And if there comes a time where you can't stay at home, how would you feel then? And most people, I would say most people would be like, look, at the end of the day, I don't want to be a burden on my children. So if push comes to shove and I have to be in this place, then okay, at least pick out a better one for me, you know? <laughs> I was, I laugh because- At least because... if you can talk about it, mm -hmm. it kind of takes that guilt off of your children because that guilt of like is my mom okay with the fact that I put her in the nurse this place she does not want to be that's awful that's really awful so my mom was 74 after when my dad died and we moved her to memory care and she died at 77 so it's like literally three years and a couple weeks later and there are times it's like well, if I had known it was only going to be three years, would I have made a different decision? And if I'm honest, the answer is no, I would not, because she really did well. Being a younger resident, she mm. was always offering to assist the other resident. Let mm. me know if you need any help. She'd always tell them, and I'd be like, oh, dear, please no. <laughs> but it gave her kind of a sense of purpose, whereas in my house, if she had said, oh, let me know if I can help, it'd be like, oh, my God, no, go away. <laughs> you know, just right. it would not have been at all ideal. So um, I really it. wish we could have had the conversation because I think her reluctance to n living any place but her home, which they bought that house in 1970 and we moved her out of in 2017. So that's 47 years, 57 years. Long time. I can do math, right? <laughs> and so obviously, like, who the heck wants to make a giant change at that point? You know, like, they've been there forever. Um, and I believe that my grandmother had been in an actual nursing home, not a memory care residence that I can recall. Um, that was Medi Medi Medicare or Medicaid. But it was subsidized. So it was definitely not a five-star place. Not sure any of them rate that high, but it was bad enough that they took my grandmother back out and my mom's youngest sibling, her sister, took care of my grandmother until my grandmother passed away, um, which would have been fine, but they lived on my grandmother's social security. So that just <laughs> caused other problems on the other end. So I think that experience colored her opinion. Um, I chose her memory care, not based on any, you know, standards of any sort they said they'd keep her dog with her i'm like here's money <laughs> like... well that's huge though though because you understood that her dog meant a lot to her yep so you made the the decision based on something that was super important to her thankfully my gut instinct was good because <laughs> I, I didn't check references or google you know or the legal stuff like I didn't even know if they were licensed all I knew is they were a big place and it was nice and the people there were nice and didn't seem to be too many negative things going on I felt mm -hmm. really sorry for the executive director because he had to deal with staff residents residents families it's just like <laughs> oh I don't know how much money you're getting paid but it's not enough <laughs> um so it you know it was it literally was a lot of gut instinct and thankfully it was mm -hmm. it was a good gut instinct 
so you you kind of alluded to it a little bit is to you know one this is a topic that i do teach with the alzheimer's association is on dementia conversations and one of the things that we talk about is this is not a conversation you can have one and done it's you know you got to approach it a little bit at a time because you're not going to change somebody's mind all at once you're not going to alleviate their fears with one perfect sentence so how do you suggest people start approaching this if they notice a problem with their loved one or they know that there's an issue there's health issues maybe dementia because that's what this show is all about how do we approach it so that we can at least start having these conversations yeah. I think I think you hit it right on the nail. I see this conversation as planting a seed, a seed that you nurture over time that you come back to over time. So if you notice something like something's off with your parents' memory, or um, in my case, we were really worried about my dad's memory, and then eventually he got a formal workup and a diagnosis that confirmed all of our worries. Um, and when he got that diagnosis, there was, I knew based on my experience with other people, uh, other uh, people that have had dementia, that there is this window of time when you can have this conversation with uh, your parents. And um, there was one time when they were coming to visit me. And before they came to visit me, I was like, look, this conversation wherever this conversation goes, I would like for it to be in person. My parents are kind of like, they're kind of old school. These conversations are important. This is not something I wanted to have with them over Zoom. My dad does a lot better with in-person conversations and body language. Um, and so I just gave them a heads up to be like, hey, look, um, I'm so excited that you're coming. I'm very excited to see you. Uh, would it be okay if we took maybe like 20, 30 minutes just to talk about Baba, like I call him Baba, Baba's new diagnosis of dementia and maybe how he wants to be taken care of going forward? And my dad was like, okay, I don't know what registered or what didn't, it's unclear, but my mom was like, okay, yeah, when do you want to do that? And I was like, well, actually, what about like Saturday after lunch? We could maybe do it over like a cup of coffee or something, or we could go for a walk and talk about this. Um, whatever you feel comfortable with, like, let's just take like 20, 30 minutes. And so the first piece of advice I would give is definitely give them a heads up. Definitely give them a heads up. Do not, um, do not bring this up at Thanksgiving dinner, right when you're about to carve the turkey, just because everyone is there that needs to be involved in the conversation. That is a terrible time to do it, so don't do that. Many people have done that and it went terribly. Um, so definitely give them a heads up. And then I would say, um, always start with kind of, a try to get a big picture lay of the land. And the way that I approached it with my parents was, okay, Baba, and to my mom as well, um, what did the doctors tell you about what's going on with your memory? And that's it. I didn't even use the word dementia. I just said, hey, what did they tell you about what's going on with your memory? And my dad was able to verbalize a little bit. And then my mom kind of filled in the rest. And so that gave me a big picture kind of understanding of what he understood about it. And more so what my mom also understood about it because she had been at that meeting. Um, and then we kind of went from there. And I didn't, and I always, so that's the second piece of advice is definitely try to get a general lay of the land before you get into the nitty gritty. And when you try to get that lay of the land, like don't come in with an agenda in mind. Okay. I, I mean, I'm serious. Like a lot of people will be like, okay, dad, you have dementia. This is what you need to do. And that you're just starting the conversation on a, on a terrible footing because most people are going to get defensive in response to that because they're going to be like, I've been a parent longer than you have. How dare you tell me? You know, you can just see these conversations going in terrible directions. So I it, would say it comes like, in a little aggressive. Like, yeah, okay, da, da, da. but I laughed <laughs> when you said, you do. <laughs> don't come in with an agenda. And I'm like, oh, I would probably be guilty of that. Not 
mostly because I am a planner. I like to have things mm-hmm. organized. I like to know what, you know, like, okay, what are we going to need to do for X? You know, like what's coming up? Like, so you can plan. So you're not like broadsided. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure I would have neglected getting the big picture because we had a family business together. So I kind of, I'm assuming pretty, pretty solidly here that I would have thought that I had the big picture, but not really knowing where either of my parents were in that picture, that would have been a a big loss of information. So that's a really, that's a really important thing. And I want people to like, maybe play that back a little bit because we think we know what's going on because we've been dealing with it unless they're out of the country uh, like Ashwini's parents were. Mm -hmm. But my parents were local and I had to deal with it all the time. <laughs> so it was been, been very easy to be like, I know what's going on. Okay. Now on to step two, we're going <laughs> to. Because the truth is like you're coping with it, but your coping is very different from how they may be dealing with it. So I think that big picture of lay of land is really an, about understanding, hey, how are they dealing with this? What did they understand from what the like doctors and medical team said how are how are they thinking about the future now now with what they know and so definitely like keep an open mind and i would actually say the third piece of advice is those initial conversations i don't think for most people uh you don't have to make any decisions in those initial conversations for most people I would say um, those initial conversations are more to those initial conversations are more to get like a second conversation so that they're willing to talk to you on a second occasion as things change. Um, I would say that is the purpose. And I would also say that the purpose is really to help them and help you get comfortable talking about something that is hard and that's emotional. And I think for most people, unless you're like in the hospital, in the ICU and things are moving fast, that's a very different situation. Uh, For most people, you don't have to make any decisions right then and there because you're probably still processing and they're probably still processing. Would you recommend or did you do with your mom? So the caregiving spouse to have like a separate conversation, like how they're processing it because both my parents were lousy caregivers. My mom did not help with her mom. My dad was very, my dad was an engineer. I think that should explain most of it. It was like, (laughs) yeah, he just, you know, he did the best he could. I'm not being critical, but he really was terrible. She'd ask a question, he'd answer it. She'd ask it again. He'd just snap out an answer. I already answered that question. You know, which of course never is not ever good, but it, it never helped at all with her. So, and I kind of always wondered, he, he was very reluctant to have me help. Even, you know, I was trying to help him because he was frustrated and more stuck at home with her. So I researched an adult day program, got all the information. Like we were up to like step two, which was, in, you know, um, tour the place, you know, the three of us together and, you know, do things in person. And he just shut that down. And I'm like, but that would give you time away from her to alleviate the frustration, to do the things with your friends, to do the volunteering you do, you know, to go to the doctor without having to worry about her. Like, what, 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 why? (laughs) Still like, still like an answer to that one, dad. Um, You know, like a little heavenly note would be good. And I wonder if somehow I was able to have a conversation about how he felt as his, as her husband going forward because now the relationship is very different and i've talked to enough, enough spouse caregivers that that's really hard because we're our parent is changing and we're losing them but it's it's very different for a spouse so did you ever have the separate conversation with your mom oh a hundred percent Um, because I noticed that she was having understandably a very hard time and I'm not sure how many people she felt comfortable talking with and, um, her experience understandably is very different from mine. She's losing her husband, her spouse, her companion. And the hardest part is 
he's physically right in front of her, right? And Mm -hmm. uh, physically, he's great. Um, But, you know, the personality, his interests, um, they're changing. And she notices that and she feels a tremendous loss. And um, it became very clear that she needed someone to talk to. It couldn't be my dad. And it couldn't be me because there are certain things that she didn't feel comfortable sharing with me, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And she needed someone else. So she actually um, has gotten a lot of support through a dementia support group that's local and in their community. And I feel like she has learned a lot about how to interact with my dad um, because, you know, he'll repeat things or he'll ask the same question, things like that. And she's gotten education around how to respond to that, that you know, it's not personal. He didn't like not hear it. And he didn't he, not hear her response like 20 times over. Um, you know? It's not a hearing problem. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a dementia a problem. <laughs> Keeping, yeah. Um, and so I really feel like a hundred percent, she definitely, um, I think that caregiving spouse needs support of their own. And there's only so much that you can do as a daughter or a son because there are only so much, like, they may not feel completely comfortable sharing all of their experiences with you. And that's okay, but they just need to have a safe space where they can share that. Um, And so definitely, I think it's definitely worth talking about because uh, what they're going through is incredibly hard and they do need a space to process and think about um, and probably experience like to be angry with their spouse, to be resentful of their spouse, right? Like all of those feelings um, that come up because, and the relationship has changed now. Um, so a hundred percent, I think that caregiver spouse needs a place for themselves as well. The support group I facilitate, man, they're amazing. They barely need me. <laughs> <laughs> they're just so supportive of each other that it and a lot of them at this point i think the majority of them have moved their loved one to a memory care residence um, whether it's a spouse or a parent and everybody's experiences are so different and yet they're still so supportive so i am i was in a support group now i facilitate one so i'm i am a huge proponent of support groups but you said you really couldn't have all these conversations with your parents so your um caregiving coaching partner kind of stepped in so how can you kind of walk us through like how you realized that that you needed like a backup somebody else to kind of yeah. step in and and get some of these questions to answered and some yeah. some plans laid down <laughs> No, absolutely. So I can only go so far. So even though I do this every single day with a lot of other people and their parents, um, when I came to my own parents, I think there were some cultural differences at play. Um, I think to a certain extent, they're a little old school and they didn't look my family, to be honest, we don't talk about feelings. We don't talk about emotions. So for us to get into something that was emotional, I think was really uncomfortable for them. And um, so at one point, my mom and my dad were like, can we just talk to someone else? Cause like, it just, they just didn't feel comfortable sharing what they wanted to share. And so that's when I, I asked my colleague who is also a physician and she's also a caregiver coach. And I was like, look, do you think you could uh, help my parents with these conversations? Because I think it's really important to have. I think my dad is able to take part in these conversations right now. And I want them to have a safe space to talk about things where our father, daughter, mother, daughter dynamic doesn't get in the way. <laughs> and some of the like cultural things of um, that, that they don't get in the way either. And so Uh, Luckily, my parents were open to talking about it because I kind of, I told them, look, I think my dad, my, his mom had dementia too. And so he saw what that looked like. And I think that gave him the insight to be like, I know how this could go. 
So let me just, if my daughter really wants to do this, let's just like make some plans, have these discussions. And so they, I think because of that experience, he was a lot more open to having this conversation with Caitlin, who is um, a physician and a caregiver coach as well. So um, so I basically just kind of email connected them <laughs> with my uh, colleague and uh, she and my parents had the nitty gritty conversation and at the end of the conversation, um, she wrote down all of my dad's wishes. Like, I'm not talking about, does he want resuscitation? Does he not? These were wishes around how he wants to live. Like, what does he enjoy on a day-to-day -day basis now? What brings him meaning now? Um, how would he feel if he wasn't able to kind of walk on his own? What kind of support would he willing would he be willing to have in the home? Is he okay with people coming into his home? What if things got to be too much at home and the safest option was a nursing home or a memory care unit? How would he feel about that? Um, so we they they went there. <laughs> they went there and I'm so glad I did they did because. At the end of it, Caitlin, uh, the caregiver coach, she wrote down all of his wishes of how he wanted to live and then his wishes in terms of end of life wishes as well. And uh, my parents eventually like printed out that document, shared it with me because they wanted me to have it as well. And when I read it, I got a very good um, description of what brought my dad what made life worth living for my dad. Uh, and that's what brought me to tears because what made that it worth living for my dad were the small moments. It, it was the small moments. It was spending time with the grandkids. It's going for a walk. It's like these really small things. And the reason why that's so important to know is because at a later point, if you're ever in a situation where you're like, okay, should dad go into a nursing home or not? Um, you can think about ways to be like, okay, going for a walk was important, but maybe he can't walk right now. But hanging out with the grandkids was important, like having some social element was important. Is there a way that we can recreate that in the nursing home if we choose to do that? Or I don't know if something happens and he ends up in the hospital and uh, they asked me kind of what would be important to him now. I can be like, look, being able to communicate with his grandkids and his kids was really important. Like having intellectual capacity and ability to engage with other people was really important. And so regardless of what situation may come up in the future, I have no idea what may, but at least if I have a set of values that I'm like, look, this is what's important to my dad. Uh, how can we respect it now in this situation? What's the best way to respect it? And look, there may come a point where he can't go for his daily walks that he loves. Is there a way that we can maybe have him see nature? Like, because that's one of the things. Or is there a way that we could maybe help him engage with PT or OT to just get him moving a little bit? Or I don't know, could he watch a video of someone walking in nature, you know, like you can get creative like that. If you understand what someone values that way, regardless of what happens to them, what decisions come up for them, you can be like, look, this is what's important to my dad, medical team, care team. How can we honor that now? I think that's what was really, uh, beneficial and what came of that that conversation that he didn't have with me i think that's a powerful knowledge to have for anybody that's in yeah. your life because i'm thinking back on both my parents and i'm like i don't really know with certainty what what was important to them on a daily basis i mean like i can i can guess and i think i stumbled into what what made my mom happy just based on kind of desperation and knowledge. Um, you know, she, she liked, she, you know, she was a mom and a grandmother. So she liked to be around, she liked to be around children, not necessarily little ones. So we would go to the park and watch kids play, or we'd go to the pool. Sometimes we'd go to the library if the weather was bad um, because she couldn't do a whole lot more. She was 
mm-hmm. ambulatory. She didn't need any walking aids, but getting from point A to point B was always a challenge because she liked to walk behind me and she watched her feet. So everybody's heard this story. I was terrified she was going to face plant the sidewalk and I was going to be the evil person because I never let her catch up to me. <laughs> and now that I, you know, I'm like, I'm thinking about it. She needed that social outlet. She needed that kind of mom grandma outlet. Um, we, if we didn't have her dog, because she only had her dog half the time that she lived there, um, she had mine. <laughs> I have golden retrievers, and um, I'm just trying to think. Like she, she would take care of the household. That's what she did, and yeah. she was trying to take care of the other residents if they needed her. So it's like we kind of stumbled on those things without yeah. actually knowing them, and you know. It's like knowing that about your spouse or like your right. kid, like my daughter's almost 33. Like what, what's important on a day-to-day basis for you? Like you get up, you go to work, you take care of your cats. Like what, what else, you know, I might have to ask her that. <laughs> yeah, you should. <laughs> because it's just such powerful knowledge because it's what makes us tick. Like I understand my husband has like, he's a real estate broker and he owns his own business, but he decided to go into um the private security in our community which still kind of baffles me but it's okay but i also understand that he needs the colleagues to be us with and the structure of i have to be at work from x to y and you know have a you know specific work email address and hierarchy it's like all that stuff makes me nuts i don't (laughs) understand it i don't like it that's why i do what i do but knowing that it's like okay you know, I'm fine with this decision because I know that this is what you need. And, right. you know, God forbid he ever got dementia. I would, if I was smart enough to remember all this, that he would need like that structure and that's that social structure, you know, or else he'd probably be really a pain in the butt to take care of. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's the other thing. It's, you know, a lot of people, um, one of the reasons they don't kind of have the talk with their parents is because they always they always tell me I can't predict the future. I don't know what's going to happen to them. That's true, a hundred percent true. But the thing is, if you understand what is important, what their values are, what brings them joy on a daily basis, like not joy, but like just the little things that you know give them purpose. Um, you have a set of values that you can present to the medical team so that the next time they ask you, hey, like, did you ever have a conversation with like your spouse about what they would want? You can be like, actually, we did. And this is what's important to them. So that no matter what situation comes up, you have something to bring to the table. You have something to offer. You have input that gives voice to this person that you love. Um, And I think that's incredibly powerful. And I think for me, that's the like number one reason to have this conversation is really to, I think, um, give voice for in a situation when your loved one may not be able to speak Um, and know that you're doing your best to do right by them. Um, And that's why I say, look, you don't need to know what's going to happen in the future. You can't predict that, but you can offer a framework and a set of values that can help you make decisions in the future. It all goes to that person-centered care. You understand the person better, so then you can provide care to them more specifically toward their needs. Exactly. Like your dad and my mom, both with dementia, probably need very different things although it sounds like it might be similar but in general there's just things that you know my mom was happy being at home but she needed a little socialization that's a lot like me that's creepy (laughs) (laughs) like a little social battery is fine don't i don't need overwhelm um but yeah we always talk about person-centered care but i don't think people really explain it and having these conversations gives you those tools to one, at least have a better sense that you're going in the right direction. You're not just hoping and praying you're making the right choices and feeling guilty that you might be making the wrong choices and looking backwards and thinking, yeah, I think they were the right choices, but still like four years later, I still kind of like wonder if I made the right choices. 
But yeah, it's all about tools. Because if we didn't learn from COVID, good Lord, we seriously cannot predict what's coming. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. What a, what a year. So how, if we're, just to wrap up real quick, if we're struggling to have these conversations for whichever reasons, how does somebody get a hold of you so that they can, they can expedite getting some of this information before it's too late? Yeah. Uh, so you can head to our website. It's www.epionemd.com. And there we offer two services. The first one that I actually want to highlight because it's so relevant to this conversation um, is we actually launched a course. It's called Unlock the Conversation, which is all about guiding someone through step-by-step -step how to have this conversation with their parents or their in-laws or their spouse, whoever that loved one is, and to do it in a way so that you know what you should be talking about, how to talk about it. And we literally give people like scripts. We give people scripts because one of the things that gets in the way is like, I don't know what to say. I don't want to fumble through this conversation. 100%, this is a very important conversation. It's a sensitive topic. You do not want to fumble into it. You want a game plan. And so that's essentially what that course is. And it walks people through it step by step. And we troubleshoot the common roadblocks that come up and the common like resistance phrases that people have, right? Um, so that's going to be a really helpful tool because it's going to guide you through the conversation um, and kind of have someone in your corner as you go through it. And then the other one, we do offer one-on-one -on -one personalized coaching. So this is exactly what I did for my parents because um, for various reasons, they didn't feel comfortable talking with me. And to be honest, like I said, um, I don't think I was comfortable uh, listening to their responses. The responses that came to my colleague, Caitlin, that they shared with her, um, I wouldn't have wanted to hear those responses, if I'm being honest. Um, and so for them to have kind of this third party safe space where they could share their wishes and then eventually it got routed to me, that was perfect. Um, so for folks that are interested, that's where the caregiver coaching can be really helpful as well. Well, it's it's heartening to hear that you weren't necessarily ready to hear things and you were lucky enough to have an option. So that's, I think that gives people permission to, to take different steps than yeah. maybe they were planning on. So, and I also want to say, look, there are going to be people listening to this who are like, this is all great, but my loved one can't take part in this conversation. And that's actually the perfect reason to spend time with either a coach or someone who's skilled in having these conversations to help figure out what is important to your parent even now. Um, that way, you know what you're working towards. You know what's important to your parents and what should be at the center of your parents' care as well, even if you never talked about it before. Um, so I, I do want to kind of say that because I know a lot of people uh, haven't had these conversations and they won't be able to have them directly. <laughs> Right. But I think uh, there's a lot of work we can still do to honor our parents and who they are and how they chose to live their lives. I would have definitely benefited from that because I just I felt like I was. I was figuring everything out on the fly and hoping I was making the right decisions. And, you know, like I said, my dad died when my mom was 74. I thought she had easily 10 more years to live, which she might have had she not fallen and broken her leg. And, you know, it's just, oh, yeah, yeah. it was just always, my goal was always to give her the best quality of life, make her as happy as possible without dragging out dying from Alzheimer's. But it was not, I mean, th those three sentences are simple to say. It was not easy to navigate because I was always questioning myself. Like, um, is this the right choice? You know, is she really enjoying watching these twins at the library? <laughs> she seemed to be. <laughs> You know, and it's just, you know, does she enjoy going to the park enough that getting from the car to the bench is worth the struggle that I was feeling? Maybe she wasn't feeling it. So, yeah, I would have definitely benefited from that. So I hope you guys take advantage of this kind of service because, you know, your peace of mind matters a lot. And everybody should always know 
websites and everything um, are hot linked in the show notes. So just scroll down under the description. You'll see the website. It'll be hot linked. You can click on it and go right to the coaching or the course. I I strongly encourage you guys to do that because man, I really wish we'd had some of these conversations. I had to have these kind of conversations over seven plus years with guests. And I've learned a lot of things that I wish I'd known when my mom was still alive. So yeah. don't be like me. Click on the website <laughs> and have the conversations. Yeah. And I think that when I think about all, like I, I still think it's one of the greatest gifts you can give your kids. And it's, I also think it's one of the greatest gifts that one of the greatest conversations you can potentially have with your parents too, because even at the end of all of this, I felt like um, it brought my parents and I closer together. We had a better understanding of just what made life so valuable for my parents and for my dad. And so in that sense, I feel a lot closer. It doesn't take away the pain of, you know, losing someone to dementia. It, it doesn't. But at least I feel like, okay, I, at least when push comes to shove, I can do right and I can second guess a little less. I can what if a little less, you know? And yeah, that's worth it to me. And if it's a conversation that, like I said, will change and evolve over time, um, I think that just planting that seed is incredibly important. I agree. And I'm just going to leave it right there so people can dwell on that beautiful sentiment. And I thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here and I'm such a fan. So I hope that this was helpful to the people that are listening. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.